Mm -hmm. Hi, and welcome. This is our uh, second session of three for Girl Scouts doing outreach to other Girl Scouts or um, folks doing astronomy outreach in general. Uh, we're starting off with this astronomy picture of the day. It's every day there's a new resource there and there's a huge archive of images there. And so a way you can start with the girls is to say, what is this picture? What do you see? What do you see happening? Right? Um, you can put your thoughts in the chat. We already have a couple. Uh, if you wanna pause it here, if you're watching the recording, I'm gonna jump ahead and show you what it is. So this is Titan. It's around Saturn's moon and um, uh, Mike guessed it in the chat, right? Um, and he said he saw atmosphere and shapes on the surface. And I mentioned that um, I see the rings of Saturn behind the image, which Tammy said looks kind of like a table, right? It has like that grain of a wood grain of a table, right? But it's the rings of Saturn. And so um, every day APOD puts a picture up with a description. So this is the description. Um, if you're going to be doing it with young girls, especially you want to use easier language than what comes with APOD, but this is a, just an idea of what the description is that they put there. Definitely great resources. If you don't know it, you should check it out. And here's today's agenda. For this session, we're going to be talking about Girl Scouts and STEM, what's important to them. Uh, the ages and stages that we've done is showing um, what's appropriate for each age level. We're not doing all of the levels of Girl Scouting. We're only doing today juniors and cadets. If you're interested in the daisies and brownies, you can watch that recording. And if you're interested in the seniors and ambassadors, you can come next week. Um, we're gonna be talking also about the messages we send. And then we're gonna show you some activities that go with the badge steps for juniors and cadets. Let's just jump right in with the um, STEM outcomes. Hey, right? um, Girl Scouts really does not want to be like school or a test. So there isn't going to be a list of constellations you have to know. But what we're trying to get is STEM interest, STEM confidence. Right? We want girls to be able to see themselves as able to do science. Right? Because we use these skills every day and we want to create a scientifically literate society. And for the women they become to help them feel at home in the sciences. So these are the four outcomes that we have. I'm Teresa Summer, and um, I work with the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. And Vivian White is with me as my co host. Um, Vivian, do you want to talk about the poll that we're going to have? Yeah, I just wanted to see who you all are, um, because we aren't going to be able to see you today. Often we hold events with girls that are interactive. Um, so this is a webinar, not a Zoom meeting. So it's not quite as interactive, but you can use a lot of fun resources. So here we've got po a poll, and I'm going to launch it right now. Um, if you want to check and let us know who you are, um, you can check as many as you are. Um, My name is Vivian, and I work with amateur astronomers at um, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. I um, work with the NASA Night Sky Network, and so I know some of you through there. I see a lot of familiar names. It's great to have you there. And, and I'm an astronomy educator with ASP and or the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, because we have a lot of acronyms, so it's always good to define them. <laughs> right? But um, I'm an astronomy educator, and so I work with Girl Scouts and with the Night Sky Network and with everybody else who comes along, school teachers, children, park rangers, whatever needs done. All right, so I'm gonna share the results of this poll now. We have almost 80% of us, let's see. Let's see, there we go. Who are you? Oh, um, a lot of informal educators. Wonderful. Like Vivian and I. <laughs> Great, and Girl Scout staff and volunteers and some Girl Scouts as well. It's and teachers to too. Great to have you all here with us. Excellent, okay, I just wanted to check in and see before we kick everything off. 
Thanks so much for letting us know. Kind of helps us gear our presentation. Um, one thing you might not know about the Girl Scouts is that there's a research institute that's connected with them and they do all kinds of research on girls' experiences and also their attitudes. And um, they've come up with these three processes that are the most effective to help girls have an exciting science experience um, or part of, they're also called their leadership uh, processes too. About Girl Scouts is a lot about getting girls outside, getting girls to be leaders. Um, so the first one that we really want to have is to have the um, sessions that you're having be girl-led. And what that means is not that they take over everything, but that um, as it's appropriate, you want to give them as many choices as possible. Um, in the groups we're talking about today, the juniors and cadets, there are so many things that they can do. Um, so there's a lot that they can help with or um, lead. Um, as much as possible, we wanna do hands-on activities. It's a little hard to do hands-on activities in a webinar, but we're gonna try our best to do these virtually. And um, that's really a great way to learn. Um, another thing is that girls love to talk together and work together. So cooperative learning is really something you want to foster if you can. Um, this is the Girl Scouts of Northern California, um, girls, um, keeping things girls led in virtual settings. And it has each of the levels of Girl Scouting. Uh, today, we're gonna talk a lot about the juniors and cadets. And so we kind of are highlighting this. Um, notice that's, oh, I, I just got saw a note in the chat that those three processes, these are um, Girl Scout leadership experience. Thanks so much, Maureen. Hard for me to remember all those acronyms. <laughs> yeah. So um, these are things you can do in a virtual environment to keep things girl led. Um, like you, maybe you, with the juniors, you can have a brainstorming session and have them discuss things together. Um, whereas the cadets, they're um, in middle school, so they can already plan their whole year ahead and what they want to do. Um, so hopefully they're doing lots of space science badges, which we're gonna be talking about today. I will say too, that this is kind of the, the biggest uh, range in ages and stages that we're gonna be talking about. When we did the younger girl badges between kindergarten and third grade, there were not too many changes. A lot of those things worked for all the girls. And again, when you get into high school, a lot of the activities will work for a range of girls, but between 10, and 14, there's a big shift that happens for girls. So while some things are gonna remain the same, these are some uh, kind of specific uh, activities and tips that will work for the different ages. Right. Great. Um, there's also some things that are similar, right? Um, they're becoming more independent and they're doing their own thing. Um, so we can give them good feedback on what they're doing, but we don't need to be as hands-on with the, um, hand, um, instructive with them, I guess we should say. Uh, we just want to be patient and encourage them. And so these um, slides will be available to you after the session. So don't worry about copying all this stuff down. It's more to give you an idea that we're moving away from being animated and jumping around to having a serious discussion and also um, still being fun um, and interactive, but um, it's a little bit older. Uh, um, last time we talked about graphics that you can use. This is a style of graphics that you can use for these age girls. Um, and so you can put this in the chat if you are interested in letting us know if you consider yourself more an astronomer, an engineer, or an astronaut. If, um, not in career-wise per se, but maybe in um, that you like to explore new places or build things. And so I will keep an eye on the chat to see your one, twos, and threes. That's a great chance to talk about vocabulary because a lot of, um, folks think astronaut and astronomer are almost synonymous. 
So, oh, all of them, look at you all. <laughs> Great. Yeah, there's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of one, two, threes. There's a couple of twos, a couple of threes. Yeah, it's just a good way to get to know the girls and it kind of helps you steer your presentation. Do you want to do more technical stuff because they all want to be engineers or do you want to have lots of cool space images because they're all astronauts? Um, one caveat that I want to mention is that middle school is a really difficult time uh, and girls can be very self-conscious. Also, um, they're spending more time with their friends, they're figuring out their identity. School can start to get hard. Um, many people kind of sail through elementary and then they get to middle school and there's kind of a drop off in science confidence that happens with girls in STEM at this age. So you really wanna make sure that your girl experiencers are positive and encouraging. Even if their girls aren't understanding things yet, you really wanna focus on having a fun failure um, or talking about a time that you found math hard um, because there's math is hard for everybody at a certain stage, whether that's differential equations or um, division. Also, you can, um, there's a lot of, of good resources about why um, girls uh, have a, a tougher time in middle school. Here are some girls that are in middle school and let's um, have them share their voices. If you think about it, science is like everything. It can really help you uncover like little small little secrets. I built a garage door opener and I'm working on my own website. I built a computer and I opened a fridge with a Lego. When I was littler, I used to think technology was great. And then I started thinking that it was more of a boy's thing. Now you think that Inventing is like for boys because they have Albert Einstein invented if he was a guy and girl in the robotics class, but she quit and so I'm the only girl left. Oh, you can't like science. You're a girl. You can't like any of these science things. In commercials, I saw a lot more men doing it. They might really love science, but they might be like afraid people might think, oh, don't boys do that? That's a boy thing. If you think about it, science is like. I okay, I'm just going to pause it there because it's it's a YouTube video and it actually is a commercial, but I really. Um, thought it was representative of some of the struggles that girls have at this age. So I wanted to share that with you in case you ha haven't been a girl in a while or ever. It's uh, good to know that these are challenges that girls these ages are facing. Um, some of the tools we're addressing the challenges with are growth mindset and language. If you're interested in learning more about that, we covered that in our last session. And we're going to be talking about micro messages and storing telling in this session. And then the next session, we're going to talk about questions and misconceptions and, and ways to foster scientific thinking. And in every session, we're going to explore Girl Scouts culture and the new space science badges. Can I hop in with one quick thing? Of um, course. In our longer sessions, we also covered that it doesn't take a whole lot of time um, to expose girls to new um, and exciting ideas in science. So even just having them have one positive science experience can make a huge difference in the same way having one negative science experience can kind of bum them out and not make them want to uh, do science as much. So these are great opportunities to give girls um, a, like a science recharge. And we'll put the, there's a lot of research that's been done on that and we can add that to the, um, to the YouTube video as well when we're done. Right, and these are just welcoming tools. So they're good for girls, boys, kids, grownups, and everyone. So um, let's explore the messages that we're sending when we are doing outreach. 
So Viv, you want to do some talking about micro messaging? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you might have heard of um, some people have talked about microaggressions, but microaggressions might not be aggressive or intentional, right? Micro messages is what we're calling them because they're just these little tiny behaviors and ways that we act um, that can affect how we uh, treat each other. So. Uh, you can tell here on the left, there's a woman who's leaning in and clearly listening to whatever the speaker is saying, and she's giving the speaker a micro affirmation, showing that they're interested, showing that she's interested and showing um, that she cares about what's being said. The same with the center picture. They are clearly having an interaction where the adult is interested in what's going on. Um, counter that with this picture on the right about uh, that's a micro inequity. So um, it says this is from um, I2M Harvard, which is a group of um, students of color who have who are sharing on Tumblr some of the messages that they have gotten um, that were not welcoming. So this picture here says you're lucky to be black. It must be easy to get into college. And um, these micro messages, um, they build up over time. People call them death by a thousand cuts and they have huge implications for um, people's uh, feeling about themselves in the sciences, for example. So they can cause depression and trauma, um, even advanced aging and illness. So there's a lot of, we'll put the slides on the um, recording and that has some of the studies in there. So we all get these messages all the time. Can you think of any micro messages that you might have heard as you've gone along in life? Um, they're not always bad. We just um, want to start to be aware of what micro messages we might be sending and some even that we're getting. So if you want to put in the chat anything, micro messages that you've heard along the way could be about science, it could be um, something that boosted you up or something that you know, made you feel not as good. I have an example I could share. Um, there has been times when I have been running the planetarium or um, an observatory and people have gone to either the male usher or my assistant because they are male and they don't see uh, women as the people who are leading things in the scientific setting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a friend we went to college with who is a dancer and she's absolutely beautiful. And she often gets told, you're too pretty to be a scientist. She is an incredible PhD um, uh, solar physicist at this point. Um, yeah. Right. Um, sometimes what we wear can um, have people make assumptions about who we are. All right. So let's um, let's take a look at how we might address something like that. So there's kind of two parts to this. It's really good to notice when we are doing it, just to stop and think about the messages that we might be sending. Now we do this all the time, right? This is something that <laughs> uh, we do. Uh, for example, I might be able to say something to my best friend um, that would be really ridiculous, it would be kind of jokey, but then if I said the same thing to my boss, that would not be appropriate, right? So we are able to make all of these layered decisions about how to talk to people all the time. We navigate this all day. So we just need to think about how what we say might be heard by girls that we're working with. So it takes some practice and it can be really subtle. So don't worry if sometimes you're not sure. Um, just like we talked about last week with that growth mindset, if we practice doing this, then it can be, um, then we'll get better at it. So recognizing when we do it can be a little harder. It might be something that as we go along in the world, it might be easier to see when someone else does it. So recognizing when someone else does it can be your first step. The second piece here is sometimes easier to see in others. Um, however, it, sometimes saying something about it can take some practice. So um, I am going to, well, I should say, you know, we recognizing when we're doing that can be a little tricky, right? 
Um, we can't always tell if it's a microaggression when someone's doing that. Of course, there's a million people come with a million different backgrounds and reasons for saying something, but you can see usually in the person's face who they are talking to, you can often tell when, if they feel that it's been a microaggression. So it could be a frozen, you could get really hurt or angry. And, and I encourage you when you see something like that to go ahead and speak up. This does take some practice, but it can be simple. Um, for example, I often use the phrase, oh, we don't do that here. And just let it go and carry on with what I'm doing. Does anybody else have a go-to line that they use when someone says, like one of my pet peeves is there's no girls allowed in this whatever camp or um, something that they're setting up. Like, um, and I say, oh, we don't do that here. So um, um, I'm going to share my screen just for a second, if I can, and share one of, so if you are not familiar with TikTok and you're working with young girls, you definitely should be because TikTok is all the rage these days. Um, and uh, there's a TikToker, her name is uh, Makey Woods, and she shares what she, um, let's see, I'm going to share my screen, two shakes. Uh, I'm going to share what she, what her go-tos are for addressing micro messages. Oh, there we go. Okay, let me share the sound. Two shakes. Okay, here you go. I hope you can hear this. So here are a couple of responses that you can practice when responding to microaggressions as a bystander. Ouch, that really hurt, ouch. That's a microaggression. I am personally offended by that. Nope, we're not gonna do that. Nope, 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 nope. What I think you're trying to say is that she has a powerful and passionate voice, not that she speaks really well. What other strategies have I missed? Drop them below in the comments. All right, so if you have other strategies that you use um, when you hear a microaggression um, or a micro message that you feel like is not appropriate, go ahead and put that in the chat here and um, maybe you all have some that you can share as well. Here's the thing, it sets up the, um, it sets up the space. So if, if um, uh, someone says something to a girl that is a small microaggression, like, oh, it must be great that you're a girl. It's um, really easy to get into this school if you're a girl <laughs> or something like that. Um, it, it sets up a culture where that is allowed within your group. And we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that everybody feels comfortable. So if you have anything that you want to put in the chat about how you maintain a really positive um, group setting, let me know. Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this micro messaging example, but I really appreciate that point about how we want to have a welcoming environment for everybody. And sometimes as adults, we're pretty, we can be pretty sarcastic. Um, and that can be something that girls pick up on. Um, so I've tried myself not to be, not to make jokes about people um, when I'm in outreach sessions because. Um, it's hard to explain it all and work all that stuff out. I still make jokes, um, but they're usually bad astronomy puns, that kind of thing. Okay, so here's a micro messaging example that you might not think of as a micro message or a microaggression, right? They say, oh, I would have never guessed you were a scientist, right? You're at a party, you meet a woman of color who happens to be a scientist, and you're like, I would never guess that. Um, you might even use say it in a positive way, like, yay, women in science, right? But after, over time, that becomes, you don't belong here. Um, and there's a lot of, um, there's a article that is in the comments here um, that you can see in the slides. But what happens is um, women get pushed out um, the sciences and especially in astronomy and uh, women of color, particularly they, there's a, the article is called double jeopardy, meaning that they have um, 
prejudice as a woman and prejudice as a person of color. So um, that uh, leads to less women in the sciences, even though you might be using a positive thing. I mean, because there's this whole idea of um, boy toys and girl toys that we talked about last week becoming boy jobs and girl jobs. I'm not sure if you've ever done this activity um, called Draw an Astronomer. You wanna talk about that one, Viv? Yeah, it's a really great one. Um, uh, so Draw an Astronomer uh, was, I think the first time that it was recorded uh, where they wrote up the findings was back in maybe 1966. Um, and at that point, they had um, students draw a scientist, what they thought a scientist looked like. And out of 5,000 drawings, only 28 were of female scientists, right? And all of those were drawn by girls. Um, and um, that is getting a little bit better from the 1980s and on. We kept seeing more and more children draw female scientists. That's pretty exciting. Um, and now at, at age six, about 70% of the girls will draw scientists as women, which is kind of amazing. That's a big change. However, by ages 10 and 11, this proportion totally flips around and they're back to drawing almost, uh, well, about 75% of the men as scientists, uh, scientists as men. Um, so this middle school age is a critical period uh, where they're learning this gendered information about who is a scientist and what a scientist looks like. So um, we want to make sure to counter this with lots of different techniques. Um, a really good one Teresa is going to talk about next. Okay, so here's our example, right? Um, these are three women of color who were involved with NASA, and I would love it if you know who they are to put them in the chat. Right? Um, sharing the stories of women of color scientists will help counteract those negative messages that uh, girls can get. I'm waiting to see. That you can use called the count to 10 and just silently count to 10 because it does take time for people to become aware that they're being asked something and then to figure out. Oh, I think you're glitching just a little bit, Teresa. It takes a little bit of time. Um, someone put NASA lady computers. Yeah, um, a lot of people know these women from um, that Hidden Figures movie or the book, right? They are Katherine Johnson, Mary Jackson, and Dorothy Vaughn. And um, their stories are told in Hidden Figures. If you haven't seen that movie, I would definitely recommend it. Go out and watch it tonight. Um, yes, there's, a, as someone said in the chat, there's a doll of Catherine. Yeah, so there's um, a lot of really, um, she has two NASA buildings named after her. And she got an award from the ASP. Not that that's the top honor, but it definitely, uh, she's a, a hero to us. So we really need to share everyone's story because then we can um, be welcoming, right? Um, so when we look at a variable star or we see a faraway galaxy in the telescope, do we mention Henrietta Swan-Levitt as much as we might mention that it's the Newton telescope and you know talk about Newton? So there's lots of different people and we don't know the impact of a story. So I'd like to tell you one now. Um, are there any Star Trek fans out there? Sadly, I can't see you. So if you raise your hand, let's, I, you might be a Star Wars fan too. That's fine. <laughs> I'm not gonna get into that. But um, this is Lieutenant Uhura. And she's the actress, uh, Nichelle Nichols. Right. Oh, I see a couple of people raising their hands virtually. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so um, Michelle Nichols, when she got started on Star Trek, they recorded one season and they weren't sure if it was going to be going again. And um, she decided that she wanted to go back to Broadway and, and do shows on Broadway. And Gene Roddenberry was like, we got the green light for season two. Let's we want you there. And um, she said, no. Um, 
And he said, well, I want to introduce you to your biggest fan. So maybe he, they could just talk to you. And um, it was Martin Luther King Jr. was her biggest fan. And um, he said this was such a great show and that it was the only show that Coretta, his wife, and he uh, shared with their children. They all watched it together. And she said, well, thank you, I, I'm leaving the show. And he smile at meeting her just went away. And he said, don't you understand for the first time we're being seen as equals. You have an equal role to the other people on the set. And so you have to stay on. And she of course did stay on if you know the story, if you know Star Trek and she was on all the seasons of it. And what happened with that, um, being seen as an equal had consequences because if you can see it, you can be it, right? Um, the person on the left is Mae Jemison, the first African-American astronaut, uh, female astronaut rather. And she said, as a little girl growing up on the south side of Chicago in the 60s, I always knew I was going to space because Star Trek's Lieutenant Uhura had encouraged her literally to reach for the stars. And uh, it doesn't just stop there. There were lots of people. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg was inspired by her to get into entertainment. There's lots of women, um, a lot of women scientists, a lot um, who are encouraged by Nichelle Nichols. She went on to work for NASA and do outreach and um, recruitment. So um, what if you're not a role model? What if you are a male uh, amateur astronomer? That's great. Um, you can still share women's stories. For example, I'm a white woman. I don't have the same experience as a black woman, but I can tell the stories. And if, um, if someone says, oh, I got it wrong, I will apologize and learn from them and do the best I can. Um, role modeling is something we can always do, even if we don't match, right? Um, so I would love it if you can sprinkle these stories into your badge outreach of different astronomers and diverse backgrounds. And uh, let's get into the Girl Scout Space Science badges. So the next session, part of the session, we're really gonna be talking a lot about those junior badges um, and the um, cadet badges. Uh, we always do this, we have like a presentation technique and we have the badges. So this is what we're gonna be focusing on today. I wanted to tell you a little more about the badges that there are five steps with three choices. So in the content area, they're gonna have different choices that the girls can pick. Um, and there's indoor choices, outdoor choices. Um, there's always a free or low cost option because they're dealing with girls from all different um, uh, experiences and areas. Some are in rural settings, some are in the urban settings. Um, so this is just sort of an overview of the badges, all of them, except for the daisies because they're too small and they can't um, do all these steps. Right. Um, here is a list of the space science badges. You want to talk about this one, Viv? Yeah, absolutely. So um, on the last uh, webinar that we did, there were a lot of overlap. But in this, between the junior and the cadet, there is not as much overlap except among the stars. So it, we're going to start off talking about the junior badge with the solar system mostly. It's mostly what it covers and gets into stars and um, and telescopes and night sky observing. I will say that every single badge has uh, directions to go and um, check out your local uh, amateur astronomers or um, uh, planetarium or science center uh, to get the real world experience of looking up at the night sky. So um, then we're gonna, after this, we'll go to the cadet badge and that really covers light. And we'll talk more about that. So while stars are covered in both, um, it, we're looking at different uh, aspects of them, and we'll talk about both of the ways we do that. And since we're starting to get into the older badges, I just want to mention that telescopes and night sky observing astrophotography and citizen science are in all of the older girl badges. So if you are looking for something that would apply for older girls, if you're interested in astrophotography, that's a great thing to do. 
or any of those three topics. So here is the junior investigator badge. Uh, juniors are fourth and fifth graders. So they're about nine to 11 years old. They are really starting to come into their own and learn about models. And um, they can now start to use star charts because before it's very hard for a uh, five-year-old to know that this piece of paper is something that represents the whole sky. But now they do learn about maps. They know um, you can have things be scale models. And so we're gonna talk about the solar system and uh, how planets orbit the sun. That's sort of the steps of the solar system that are in the junior badge, right? So these are things that you might be called on to do if you're doing the badges, right? Um, so first they make models, then they do circling the sun or orbits, and they use tools to explore. We talked about introducing topics with an open-ended question at last session. So this is just a reminder. It's great to ask the girls, what's your favorite planet and why? Um, if you would like to put it in the chat, you can um, do that now. I noticed that a couple of people put scientist stories in the chat as well, such as Andy Jump Cannon, Celia Payne, gosh, Nick, um, Henrietta Swan Levitt, um, Carolyn Herschel. So. We did lots of jokes with the younger kids and those can be funny too, but um, asking their opinion at this age is also really, really, um, a great way to do it. If you want to put in the chat what your favorite planet is, um, we can. I like Venus because it is so extreme. Yeah, yeah. My favorite is Jupiter because it's the first I found in the uh, first planet I found in a telescope. And also because I love the four little moons. They're so cute. <laughs> uh, someone, but uh, Pluto's still a planet in New Mexico. Okay, so scale models, kind of a big word um, initially. So um, today we're gonna talk about scale models and talk about how you can use the different sizes and planets. Um, so I'm assuming that most of you have heard the term scale model before. So I'm just presenting it as if you didn't, right? Um, so that's something you might ask the girls, has anyone heard this term before? And so you can say a scale model is a copy of an object that's either larger or smaller than the object that it's modeled after, right? Um, and each part of that object is sort of adjusted in the same way. So architects build models of things they're going to, buildings they're going to build. Scientists make large scale models of atoms because they're too small. Um, so. Again, this is easier if you're in a meeting session, but if you want to talk about a scale model that you work with or know of, that's a great thing to do. Um, but girls know dolls, girls know cars. So those are scale models that you can use as a reference point. Um, you can also talk about um, doll houses. There's their models of smaller, um, a smaller version of a, a large house, right? Um, this actually is Julia Gordon Lowe's house, the founders of Girl Scouts. <laughs> well, not her actual house, but a model of her house, right? Um, and so it's just a very important tool, right? Scientists use models all the time because they're really helpful in explaining our, um, how things work, right? And they can help us understand things that are going on. Okay. So one of the steps is to do an earth moon scale model. So, um, I would have everybody get up now and run and get a ball shaped or round shaped object and bring it back. But you can just see if there's anything within your reach that's round that you can use to help use this model. Okay. If you don't have an object, it's okay to just draw a circle on a piece of paper. But round things, a lot of people have round things at home or at work. So 
if we shrunk everything on earth down to this little ball, right? Um, how big would the moon be? That's the whole earth, that ball? Yes, we're making a model. So we're taking the big gigantic earth <laughs> and making it into this small ball. So you and me and everyone we know and all the flowers and trees and lakes, they're all shrunk down to this size. This about um, three and a half inches. So what size would the moon be? Now, um, often in books, you'll see them look the same size. So maybe you think they're the same size. Maybe that you think there's different size. If somebody says they have a penny. Good guesses. Yeah. Well, pecan. Excellent. Right. Yeah. Um, so this is a ball that's about three quarters of an inch. And so that's about the size of the distance between the earth and the moon. So you can make a prediction and then you can show the girls the answer after they've made their prediction. If you're in a meeting, you can just show them with your fingers. It could be like this and this or that. So the earth's diameter, the answer is about four times the diameter of the moon. So you should be able to fit four moons across your object. Um, so maybe then you need to change this uh, one or both of your objects to make the scale model accurate. Now we're going to talk about distance, right? Because size is not the only thing that you can compare in planets and their satellites, right? So how many Earths would fit between the moon and the Earth? And this is something you can do with your hands a little bit if you don't have a background on. And you could stretch and say, are they like right next to each other or are they farther apart? Then take predictions, right? Have everybody put in the chat what they think about the scale distance. Um, and if I was doing those with this girls, I would take a little more time explaining what a model is, why it's useful, and then we would talk about this scale. Now, uh, we can fit about 30 Earths between the Earth and the Moon. So it would be like many Earths right next to each other lined up. And so um, we use this model of the yardstick eclipse. Um, it uses a one inch ball and away from it, 30 inches, we place a one quarter inch moon bead. And so you can, um, that's a, a great way to give a real physical sense about it. Uh, here's a, a GIF if you're in virtual land. You might wanna play that again. There's a little drag, there we go. Yeah, it's just gonna keep playing but it has both the models to scale size-wise and distance-wise. So here's the scale of the planet's size, and now it's going out in distance and showing you the distance. So now we've moved from the Earth and the Moon on to the solar system. Good point. And how do we know what's in the solar system, right? The solar system is made up of our star and the sun and all the objects that travel around it. So um, a fun thing to do with girls in um, junior ages is to make a funny um, solar system saying um, to help them remember the order of the planets. Um, we wouldn't really say mnemonic because it's a, um, a word that's like kind of, uh, it's kind of strange word that most people don't know. Um, it is a mnemonic that we're making, but um, we just say a silly solar system saying. So um, this is the worksheet you can have to make things that start with M. And uh, if you want to put something in the chat about things that start with M or things that start with N, you can do that. I started our sentence using many ve very excellent and just shared unusual. So you had to come up with the words that start with M for Mars. 
And then he had put mustard <laughs> and napkin, right? So of course I couldn't um, do it while we were talking. Um, so I just put in monkeys and news. But this is a silly solar system saying that you can make with the girls and they can even draw pictures and images to show the monkeys. Maybe they have little news hats on and they're saying extra, extra, you know, they can make silly pictures of that. Um, so many very excellent monkeys just shared some unusual news. Um, you can also, while you're making this, talk about the differences between the planets, rocky planets, giants, planets, ice giants. Um, I'm gonna keep going with this idea of um, models, right? We're gonna, um, we started talking about the things that go around the sun. And so one of those things, of course, is the earth. So this is called imagine your earth year um, in the badge step. You can, it's all about orbits and you could make a dance of the orbits. So um, right now um, on this slide, we're looking at winter time on the, earth, uh, on the Northern hemisphere. And so you can say, oh, what do you do in the winter? Like, what sports do you do? I could say, oh, I go skiing. Move your arms like you're skiing, right? Or um, you can do things with the weather. Um, it's snowy, so it's cold, right? Um, you can make these things up for each season. What, what are they doing in school? Um, what are they doing with their family? You can also do it with spring and do it for each of the seasons of the year. And maybe now they're gonna do play baseball. Um, so there's all kinds of fun things that you can do to just show that there's different times in the year. And then you can bring up that one orbit around the sun equals one year. And there's lots of different ways you can use to discuss the concept of years. You can also use that um, educator um, old favorite, which is what is your age on other planets? That's so fun for girls. Um, just finding out that they might be two on Saturn or um, 15 on um, Venus. Yeah, um, you can also talk about exoplanets and how their closeness to the, their star uh, affects the Goldilocks zone really depends on, on your girls and their interest levels. Yeah. You want to take cadets? Yeah, absolutely. So we're moving on into middle school here where we were talking about earlier. Um, and now we can get into really big, exciting, cool concepts. These are um, for me, really interesting, we, the whole um, idea of the cadet badge is light and how we know what we know as astronomers. So um, it covers quite a few things um, with visible light, the light that we see, how that is, can be broken up into rainbows, how it, the spectrum comes out um, of white light. Um, there's also invisible light. So we talk about all the light that we can't see with our eyes that we see in other ways. Um, and then there's quite a bit of observing and uh, light pollution is the last step there, which is really fun. And we'll talk some about that. Um, so yeah, if we wanna do the warm up, Teresa, this is what we were talking about earlier, where you start off with a question to get them interested, get them excited about a topic. Um, do you all have a favorite time of day or night where you like the light the most? Right, um, and so you can also even ask, how do you use light in your life? If you're gonna, um, and usually they'll talk about seeing in the dark, but they won't talk about radio waves or um, x-rays yet. So it's a, a fun way to get started with it. Also like Vivian was saying, is there a time of day you like the most? I love that little bit of time right around the sunset when everything's pink and orange. That's one of my favorite times of day. Oh yeah, the particular rays, absolutely. I like it when it's dark outside because then you can see the stars. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, excellent. Um, so starting off getting some ideas from girls where they start talking and thinking about light themselves. 
Um, then we can go into um, some more girl-led investigations about um, what more is there in light? What do we, what is light? Um, what's in light? So asking the girls how they could make a rainbow is a really good way to gauge kind of what their prior experiences are. Um, ask them to predict how they might make one. Sometimes they've seen a prism or um, maybe in a garden hose, they've been able to make a rainbow in the sunshine. Um, or maybe they've seen a rainbow and have thought about what makes those. Um, opening it up and letting them kind of explore what they already know and what they are wondering about is a, is a nice way to start. And then let's get into the different colors here. Um, I would love it if you all want to grab your phones. Um, girls at this age are often already um, on their phones. Uh, they might have phones with them. So if you're at a star party, you might want to let them know when it's appropriate to use their phones, let them know about dark adaptation and how it's not great to use your phones when you're trying to see the stars because you ruin your night vision. Um, but if, you're, if it's during the day, go ahead. Here's a way that they can actually use their phones. So um, go to the next step, Teresa. This is more about, uh, this is an activity that we have in the NASA Night Sky Network called Clues to the Cosmos. Um, and this is a virtual adaptation. So uh, a lot of the things that we do with the Girl Scouts in person are not as easy to do um, online, but here's a really nice way to be able to do that. So if you have a phone around, go ahead and take a picture of this QR code, and this will take you to a place. Um, this is a, an Italian artist duo, and they do amazing work. Um, and hopefully this will, uh, take you where it should go. I'm going to do it with you. So usually if you just point your camera at a QR code, it will um, it will come up with something that looks like this and just allow it to access your camera. That's a press play and allow. And then you'll be able to, you'll have a um, your own filter set, your own filter wheel on your phone, which is quite fun. So we'll go ahead and play with that for just a second. Um, this is an activity called- Yeah, be sure to take time and explore this because it's super fun and, and um, even for adults. So you wanna give people a second to play around and then get back to the signs. Yeah, absolutely. And we can play around on the next slide because there's a cool um, color wheel and just ask them questions about what do they notice? Um, what do you think those filters are doing? Um, what color does say the red filter let through? Which one can you see really well in the red filter? So if I hold this up to my screen, I don't see all of the colors coming through, just some of them. So have them discuss some of that. Um, on the left there is the spectrum of light of the star Vega. So we, when we look up at the star Vega at night, it's very bright as far as stars go, um, and but it looks white to us. When you take that light and you spread it out into a rainbow, like we can do with prisms or with raindrops, um, we see this rainbow or spectrum. And the star gives off all of these colors. When they're combined, they look white, but as we spread them out, we see all the others. And in those colors, you'll see lines. Um, that is the atmosphere of the star blocking out certain wavelengths or certain colors of light. Um, and that gives us clues to what's in, what the star is made of. It's pretty darn cool. Um, lots of uh, uh, filters are really good for doing lots of different things. If you want to go to the next slide, Teresa, this is one. Yeah, and I just want to say you can definitely show them Vega if it's in the summertime. Uh, it's just pointed out. And so they'll know this is what you're looking at. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so uh, these filters help scientists and astronomers uh, in particular break the codes of the stars, but you can also try and break a code uh, looking at these letters. If you're in person, there's a whole um, activity that you can do with this where you make your own codes and have the girls make up codes. And really, once they start doing this themselves, they get a lot of um, uh, more hands-on experience with the filters, but does anyone, can anyone um, break the code? 
If so, go ahead and stick it in the chat. Um, you want to look at the colors through so the red and the green and the blue filters to start with. Um, there is a full color wheel, but you might try that out a little later. So what color, I, I asked the girls over and over, what color is the green filter, for example, letting through? Um, oh, oh, Tammy found- Tammy got it first, or at least put it in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, Tammy. All right. Yes, and Maureen got it in red light. This one says, now you see the light. Well done. Yeah, great. Um, this just gives them some things to play with. There's also um, uh, their beautiful uh, color images of all uh, that show different things in different lights, too, So through the different filters. There's a lot more that we can go into on that. Um, but I think we're going to move on to the electromagnetic step spectrum and get on to cadet step two of the badge because um, that showed us visible light and what we see but there is so much more light that we don't see right so the electromagnetic spectrum um uh some of the cadets might have learned about light as a wave um or um about they might have heard of some of the types of light that we can't see but when you're explaining the electromagnetic spectrum if they haven't heard of it before um, it's a really good idea to tie these to common things that they know like microwaves uh, microwave um, uh, microwaves food or how about radio waves um, getting x-rays at the dentist a lot of girls have had x-rays before um, or using sunscreen to protect against uv radiation um, in the top right there, there are great videos that um, both the girls have made um, and some other partners of ours, the California Academy of Sciences and the ALMA um, uh, Telescope Array in Chile. So there are lots of great videos that will explain some of these further. If it's not something you feel really comfortable with, I encourage you to bring uh, the girls themselves in their own words there with um, with some of these videos and we'll put all those in the chat. One really fun way to do and this. And of course, it's okay if you don't know about it yet. You can explore it with the girls and learn together. Absolutely. You don't need to be an expert. Yeah, one of the best things to say is I don't know actually about that. Let me find out. And then show them how you go about finding out, finding the right information. Um, one really simple thing that we like to do is exploring invisible light with remotes. So if uh, we were working with girls, we would all ask them to go see if they can find a remote in their house. Um, this is one way that we explore invisible light. And just like we asked about getting a round object. Yeah, we, it's fun to get them to get up and do something. So give them, you know, 30 seconds to get there and get back. And they all run off and get that. So it gets them up and out. A little bit. If you have a, a, um, <laughs> a remote control around you, go grab that as well. So um, one thing that's really interesting is if you look at the colors on the remote, if you look at the um, the end where that produces the light, if you um, look at that and push some of the buttons, you don't see anything, which is interesting. Huh. All right. But if you uh, point that at the camera, uh, oh, let's see, I think you can see it better on Teresa's. Oops. You can see, yeah. That Teresa, purple light. Yeah, Teresa's goes very purple. Some, some remotes will do this and some won't. Um, pretty fun. It talks about invisible light and how there's light that we can't see. The cameras that we have on um, our phones and on the computers pick up more light than we are able to see with our eyes. Does anybody know um, what colors, what, what kind of light these remotes use? Teresa, do you know what kind of light these remotes use? Yeah, so we use infrared light, um, but not all remotes use infrared light. Most of them do. So you have to check it out before you share this with the girls. Um, this is actually a projector remote, but my TV remote and my cable remote wouldn't work. Um, so check it out beforehand. Um, and it's really kind of cool to see all of the girls in their little um, square 
pointing their remote and trying to see if theirs does it. Yeah, great. So that's a really easy, yeah, cell phone cameras as well actually are sometimes better than computer cameras. Right. Good point, Tammy. Thanks. Um, there's another really cool experiment that I think is pretty awesome. Um, that... I'm going to put my um, piece away, face yeah. away. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I was going to talk about the Herschel experiment. It's another way to do step two. There are a lot of different ways that you can do this. So if you want to um, take some time and do some investigation, the Herschel experiment is um, uh, time tested. It was one of the ways that we discovered that there were more forms of light than uh, we knew about. Um, so you need a prism and you need three thermometers. And it's a little tricky to set up, but once you get it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you want to move the box so that, let's see if you can see it in here, um, so that the prism, some of the light falls on two of the thermometers and the third thermometer is off past the red end of the spectrum. Um, and you'll see that that one also heats up and that one's detecting infrared light. So you'll notice um, if you do this experiment that um, that is a very cool way of demonstrating that actually there is light that our eyes don't see um, that is heating up the um, thermometers. Yeah, that was actually the control um, thermometer in the experiment. It was the, to see um, this is the, reg the one that is not affected by the prism and it's going to not register anything and it registered more heat than the prism colors did. Ah, and Eileen makes a good point that you want to use glass prisms. Very important. Good point. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, another really fun And it's just like if you're using a sun spotter, you want to move it a lot so that the rainbow stays all, just keep moving it uh, so that the rainbow stays in the right spot. Yep. All right. Another great, um, way to explore invisible light, uh, if, you're, if you have a computer available, um, is the National Radio Astronomy Observatory has a fabulous cosmic coloring compositor. And it allows you to make images based on radio and infrared and visible light uh, images of objects in the sky. So you can, um, for example, here we've got the Crab Nebula, and you can choose which color you'd like each of the types of light to be and how intense you want them to be. And they can, the girls can make all of their own uh, images. They're super fun and gets quite creative. I think on the next page, there are a few examples of, um, oh, these are actually, yeah. So um, you can- Yeah, so these are, um... They have a whole bunch of objects now. Like they started with the Crab Nebula uh, because it was one that we had the X-ray data for, and we had all of those different wavelengths. But um, now they have, I think, fifteen different objects you can use. Um, and another uh, area you can explore is in this thing called viewspace.org. They have a lot of interactives that will show different concepts and also show, like in, when you're talking about star formation, it'll show you the Eagle Nebula and sort of zoom in on the area. Um, and it's just a really cool way to explore. Um, so viewspace.org, good way to do step two. I realize we just passed the top of the hour. I apologize. Let's get through these last ones quickly. Um, the last step of the cadet badge is step five, uh, talks about conserving the night sky. And I've just put a few resources on here. Um, the night sky network, if you have not checked it out, has a lot of great resources on including the good night, good light activity. Um, there is a citizen science project called Globe at Night. Uh, where you can observe how dark your skies are at any time of the year. It's really fun. Um, the International Dark Sky Association gives you great tips on how to make your um, house in your neighborhood dark sky friendly and why we care because there's a lot of um, people and animals who depend on us and it's better for our own health. So get some information about that uh, from the badges themselves. Um, I just want to say quickly, if you want 
to find uh, all of these activity kits and resources and webinars for working with Girl Scouts. We have a lot of information on the Astro All page. It's just bit.ly slash Astro All, and um, that'll give you a lot more information. Um, let's see. Last but not least, uh, we just want to go over what we covered today. The activity tips here. We want to be aware of our own micro messages and those that are told around us and make sure to speak up when we hear them. We want to tell stories of female astronomers um, uh, so that we can be good role models, even if we are not female astronomers. Um, and then so some of these other things, the questioning and making models and getting up and moving around, even if you happen to be at a computer. Um, most importantly, have a lot of fun. And keep it girl led. Yes. Okay. And we have one last slide that is sort of our finishing up slide. Um, if you need to go, you're welcome to go, but we are going to stay around for if you have questions or answers. But this is Michelle Nichols, and she says that science is not a boy's game. It's not a girl's game. It's everyone's game. Right? And that's what we want to get is um, more people loving our hobby. Um, we have at the end of every uh, Girl Scout session, there's something called um, a reflect portion. So we would love it if you could share some feedback. Um, Vivian put it in the chat the feedback form that you could just, it just has two questions or three rather. So um, it's super quick. Please just go there and fill it out and we will, um, it will help us a lot. So I believe we're gonna stop the recording now. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing.